more heat! The Dodge Viper. You ever been house hunting before? You saw some great pictures online, the exterior. Then when you get there and the realtor opens the door, you see there's cat piss all over the carpet. There's holes punched in the wall and they have appliances from the 1960s. That's what it feels like sitting in the Dodge Viper. You ooh and awe ah over the exterior styling. You get in here and you realize the folks at Chrysler could have gave a shit about the interior design of this. And I understand this has been the excuse forever with this company. Oh, people don't care about the interior. Well, I'm gonna tell you something. You spend about 10 minutes inside this car in traffic, you care about it real quick. And you get separated into two camps. The, the, the guys that make, this makes you feel like a man. The micro penis factor of this car is so high. And then you get the people like me and Jack and the owner of this car who completely understand that there is a comedy aspect of it. The comedy aspect of taking people that had a huge experience in racing, how to build sports cars, race cars, and all the pedigree that went into this, it's all underneath. You have to forget about all this. And if you spend any time looking at it, you wanna vomit in your hat. And that is the best way I can describe it. The whole in entire center stack here looks like it's something out of a Plymouth Breeze. I don't even want to talk about it. It's got piano black all over the whole entire center stack, which is going to be covered in dust if you're taking this out on a track. But most likely the owners are not. They're going to parade it around at car shows and just look at each other. The audio system, you might as well just take it out. It just grates on your nerves. It just sounds like a blown out speaker, just buzzing in your ear. The door handles look like something out of a Plymouth Neon. The steering wheel's out of a Plymouth Neon. The vents, this is parts bin to excess. Despite the shape of the steering wheel and the look, it does feel good. You do feel like you're sitting in a driver's oriented cockpit. The shifter assembly has this strong mechanical feel. The pedal box has metal pedals. However, it is all screwed up and skewed where your feet are all twisted because the floor pan design does not allow you to rest your left foot. There is kind of this half-assed dead pedal here, but this is where the discomfort lies. You're kind of offset from the center of the steering wheel. The seats are pretty good. I'm, I, de I definitely feel like they put good seats in here for the era. They remind me a lot in terms of look of the S2000 seats with way more bolstering, way more ability to hold you in place under high g-force the last thing to talk about is visibility i don't think it's great but cars like the lotus elise and exige uh, some more purpose-built sports cars don't have any worse visibility than this but there is not a lot of glass in here but i think the major part of talking about this is in the shop so let's head in there and talk turkey So Mark, we're underneath the Dodge Viper Gen 4. This is the first Viper I've ever spent any time in. And I know you've spent some time in Vipers in the past, right? Yes, I've been in the last generation car. The, the Gen 5. A the Gen 5 on track, ACR, and just the regular one. And at, on track, I can totally just lose my mind and enjoy what that car is. But the point of this shop segment is to kind of celebrate, understand this car and look at what it is. So let's get started with that. So let's talk about the history of the Dodge Viper. It's something that many people think they know, but here I'm gonna walk you through it in its reality. So this car, or really the 92 Vipers, when these things first came out, was the homologation of all the biggest egos <laughs> in Detroit. You had Lee Iacocca, you had Carroll Shelby, Bob Lutz, and Tom Gale, big names in the automotive world if you are coming from an American mindset. And this car was supposed to be a throwback to Carroll Shelby's original AC Cobras and Daytonas. Really a man's car, big motor, no nannies, 
lots of mechanical grip and it goes quickly as possible around the track. And the design element of it from Tom Gale was a throwback as well. Some of it, Tom Gale was also the man who designed the Plymouth Prowler, mm. was this nice retro modern throwback. So it had a lot of styling presence and it just it set the world on fire in the early 90s because nothing else was like it. Nothing else is like it even to this day. Yeah. The closest thing to this is you have to turn back the clock into the 60s. So knowing that, knowing this was trying to recapture a lot of that in a modern pack in modern packaging. And be a race car, yes. really. And you know, we talk about this a lot, pseudo race car. The Viper really was a very, very successful race car when Dodge took it racing. Won at Le Mans three or four times, which is Really impressive for yeah. an American manufacturer. Right, and to take a lot of that and turn it into a street car that carries most of the impressive numbers when you are tracking it hard under the hands of a competent driver, you can go flying in this. But again, what makes a great track car does not make, make for a, a good, good street car experience. So you have to be attuned and understand what this is and be that person that appreciates what it is as well. So what else do we have? So, Mark, this was a pretty major refresh for the Gen 4, but from a suspension and architecture standpoint, largely it's the same from the Gen 3. So it's still a largely steel frame, which looks like it came out of Grandpa's shed. Yes, it looks like a truck frame almost. If you remove some of the coverings, all your beams, all of this all the way down is all steel. There's minimal use of like composite covers and some aluminum covers here. But the big thing really is to all this steel is mated in all aluminum suspension, in wheel double wishbone, in the front and in the rear, with caster adjustment, camber adjustment, toe adjustment, and your braking system has no dust covers on it with built-in ducts from the factory, from the front to cool this, and there is so much space in here. There is an immense amount of space for changing wheel tire combinations, for running slicks, for resetting up dampers. I mean, this truly is set up to go to the track. And that's one of the most amazing things about this because so many cars don't even allow you even just simple level adjustments anymore. In these later Vipers, the later generation Vipers, the threes, fours, and then fives, they started adding back some of the nannies. In this car's case, you don't have stability or traction control, but you do have ABS and they go into these massive, well, at least massive for this era, four piston brakes. Yep, and there's even Zerk fittings at the lower ball joint to keep that thing lubed up. <laughs> so you don't have to be replacing the entire lower control arm if you lose a ball joint. In some cases, some aluminum control arms you have to throw in the garbage. So they thought about this stuff. They knew people were gonna be driving the hell out of them. And they did focus on aero. I mean, this is not an ACR, but even here, everything's covered up. It is. For this era car, this is extremely rare to see this level of underbody coverings. Even this, <laughs> oil pan is probably the biggest oil pan I've ever seen in my life. It is enormous, but it's indicative of what's in the hood, under the hood. So let's head to the back, Jack, and talk about the, the rear half. All right, Mark. So, Mark, we made it to the rear of the Dodge Viper. And as I alluded to in the front, they did make some subtle changes to the Gen 4 in suspension. That's because, well, first off, there's a lot more power than there was before. They revised the motor and they revised the trans and they went to a new tire compound. So naturally they had to change the suspension tuning. So they firmed things up a little bit. They tried to do oversteer and understeer and neutralize some of the handling characteristics by changing dampers, springs, and sway bars. But the big change in the back is the new limited slip type. They went to a GKN viscous limited slip, which is a clutch back style limited differential. And they changed the gear ratios in the back as well. So this car managed to get around the gas guzzler tax of the era, which is mind blowing because this has an 8.4 liter V10. Yeah, it's enormous. So we're gonna talk about the engine in a minute, but the big thing that you're gonna see back here as well is because this is a steel frame, there is no removable subframe carrier. So all your hard points, all the welds are directly on the frame for the aluminum control arms in the back. Yeah, it's grandpa's tractor. It, it's very different looking, but the other part is ventilation, dock work. They have this huge air intake here that flows all the way through to cool the differential and then also move air out the back to help reduce the lift in the rear end. And you have a diffuser, a solid diffuser that's not all plastic and moving around like a lot of the aftermarket crap we see, but there was so much purpose in design here. These people that put the work into this car, they knew one thing, this, the engine transmission. The part that I talked about at the start, the interior where you spend most of your life, 
afterthought because their entire focus was going fast. And they were, were not working with a lot of money. This is you know, during peak financial distress in yeah, the FCA. recession, the yeah, recession was the housing coming. market was completely obliterated when this was being refreshed. So, you know, this only survived two years before they killed it off. But I think, you know, we can sit under here and talk about all the finer details, but let's take a look under the hood. All right, Mark. So Mark, what we have here is truly enormous. This looks like something to power a cargo ship. <laughs> this, this V10 is probably one of the biggest the biggest engines I've seen in any car in a long time. In just time. physical size. Forget about displacement. We just did another video with the V10, and that was the LFA. And compared to this, it looks like a four-cylinder. It looks like a die-cast model. It's like so <laughs> tiny. And this is what dominates the experience of the Viper. It, the engine and transmission, if this was some four-cylinder piece of shit, nobody would care about this car. This is why it's special. Yeah, so let me talk about the history again really quickly. So... When the Viper first came out in the early 90s, it wasn't FCA back then, but Chrysler Group owned a little company called Lamborghini. And when they were developing this, Carroll Shelby kept pushing for a big V8. But instead, Bob Lutz and the team of engineers he had underneath of him pushed for a V10. And they already had a V10 in their cargo trucks. And oh, jeez. <laughs> so they turned to Lambo and went, you know, we have this V10 that is, is an iron block. Show us how to do the aluminum casting. So that's what they did. Now, you know, history's passed. Now this is the Gen 4, which McLaren and Ricardo Group consulted on updating the Gen 3, you know, 8.3 liter V10. So they bumped out the displacement by basically reworking the entire head. They added a new valve train, oiling system. They added variable valve timing. So this thing actually does rev out surprisingly quick for how big the displacement is. And they changed the ECU. They added a Continental ECU, which was about 10 times more powerful and quick at making adjustments than the prior generation. So that all those changes may make this feel more freer revving. It bumped up the red line about 300 RPMs, which does not is not a lot, but in this car, it is a lot. When you only have 6,000 RPMs to work with, it yeah. makes a big difference. Um, and I think the biggest thing about it is the thought to airflow, heat dissipation, and durability. And we don't talk much about it during the drive, but one of the key things you walk away from is you never feel like this car's gonna break. It doesn't feel like it's particularly screwed together. It doesn't give you the confidence, oh, okay, this- Oh, this is no 911. <laughs> yeah, but it, it has the durability factor to it, and that is what is most impressive about it. Yeah, and talking about durability, for the Gen 4s, they went away from the T56 Tremec to the TR6060, which you and I both know is a tremendous transmission, nice. and they are very solid. It's in fact, I believe the the trans they use in the new Hellcats or the yeah, a new, variation the of yeah. it. Yeah, and, and this transmission or core architecture of the transmission has been around forever, and it's great because it gives you that really strong mechanical feel when you're shifting. It's got a connected feel that a lot of the newer gearboxes or the the remaining manual transmissions of this era all feel very plasticky because of the linkage. You you have a really strong connection with all of this, and that's exactly what they went, wanted to design into the Viper. This is a brutish example of, again, that car that we would have seen in the 60s with all the modern technology of the 90s and 2000s that they could have thrown at this. But I think that's a great time, Jack, to take this on the road. All right, Mark. thing around jack what are we in we're in the dodge viper gen 4 and look i know you're mr four cylinder with your three four cylinders and the fact that none of them have the displacement combined of this 8.4 liter v10 i also don't need tweezers <laughs> when i go to the bathroom <laughs> let me mark let me let me let me introduce you to my 10 friends and how you're supposed to drive the dodge viper oh, so God, no i'm gonna slip the clutch at about 2000 rpm because these tires are worth more than our lives in the rear yeah! Yeah! Oh my god. Yeah! <laughs> but that's how you're supposed to drive the Dodge Viper. Pure Neanderthal. Dude, this thing is a monkey machine. Look, you're in two camps if you drive the Dodge Viper. 
you're like us and the owner who sees this for what it is, like a prehistoric comedy car that is a throwback to the 1960s and is a total shitbox, but extremely fast and very capable. And you know, that I understand has kind of <clears throat> changed your perspective for what this car is though, hasn't it Mark? Uh, I don't know. I've always had something about this car, which I know that this thing is extremely capable. It was designed by people that knew how to set up cars for racing. This has proven itself time and time again as one of the most capable road cars, and then obviously the ACR has broken a ton of lap records. But as a street car, oh, it was miserable. When you get behind, when you when you sit inside here, and I talked about it in the interior. It oh is, yeah, you did talk about it in the oh, interior, it's Mark. Just, it's, I can't stand being in this thing. I don't care how fast it is. That to me, this is a one-trick pony, and not in a good way on the street. I don't disagree with you, right? I mean, obviously, if again, like we talked about in the shop. Nate, the owner of this, bought this because he's a track rat. And kind of like how I approached the vet, you buy it because it is unbelievably fast and very capable. But you're right, as a street car, unless you're driving it like... <laughs> just a straight up asshole. No, this, this car is not at home on the street. I mean, you can have some fun with it, but... Just drive it like a straight monkey. Yeah, this this car needs to be on a track to really understand what they did. Other than that, on the street, you're driving this 45 miles an hour. You cook in here, it's super hot. This, despite the seats being comfortable, everything else. All, all the inputs are wrong, your feet are in the wrong place. The interior is bad, it's super noisy in here. There's a ton of valve train noise. But as a special experience, it's something that... There, no, there's nothing else like this car. And it, the, a lot of the DNA that's in here has been carried over into the modern Dodge Performance products. The Hellcats, the, the same thing we love about those and that is unique about those and nobody's been able to replicate is in the Viper. You have an insane engine, a manual transmission, a car that has surprisingly good inputs. So let's talk about some of that. Steering. It is very numb. I will admit to that. It is direct, but very numb. And because the tires in this car are so massive, the front end, all it does is tram line in these kind of roads. Constantly, the wheels going both directions. And you don't really feel the level of grip in the front end. However, from a chassis dynamic standpoint, because they're, you're on your own in this car, right? Yeah. It doesn't have traction or stability control. It trail brakes really, really well. And there is a unbelievable amount of mechanical grip in this car. And the drivetrain, which you and I both know, when you have 8.4 liters in anything, dominates the experience. The motor is perfectly matched to this transmission. I mean, yeah, and I really like the TR66. We've driven it now in plenty of vehicles, and it just has this solid, like, really solid mechanical feel. And yes, this is probably the worst sounding V10, <laughs> but it still is a V10. And well, it's a Dodge V10. Yeah, I mean, let's well. be real. It, it, this is, you know, they're, they're not trying to do something that. Uh, like Lexus did or Toyota did with their V10 or BMW. This is a completely different experience. It feels brutish. The, the only way I could sum up this car, my entire experience is, and I've always thought this, it feels like Grandpa's barnyard special that he built in his shed over the course of 30 years, smoking his pipe, <laughs> his smoking jacket, drinking, and that's the spirit that's in here. This is just pure American. There's no other way to explain it. Where the Lotus, like the Exige and the Elise, the same kind of concept, the driver's car, except it was super small, four cylinders. Which, funnily enough, the owner uh, of this car also owns okay. the Elise. So that's the polar opposite of this, but the same mentality is there. This is just the American way of doing it. No, in that vein, if you like that kind of car and you're only gonna drive this at the racetrack or for small periods of time on the weekend, and you're just gonna drive like a dick on the street, it's great for that. It's way more special feeling than a Corvette or a 911. And but it still rides well. Yeah. The suspension, the suspension tuning and the damping is good. The brakes are competent. It's just, you have to get over 
everything in here. It and does not feel like a quality product. It does not. It just feels like it was thrown together. But I think that's a good time to get into the shop to talk about the final thoughts, Jack. All right, Mark. Final thoughts on the Gen 4 Dodge Viper. And you have to put in perspective the era and time frame this car was designed, made, and by who it was manufactured by. Then you start to appreciate better just how capable and how amazing the car is when it's used in its intended purpose. That is driving flat out, potentially taking it to a track and experiencing all the things that lay underneath. But when you spend time in this car on the street, from its interior space, how uncomfortable and hot it gets, the way the exhaust runs, how impractical it is, it grates on your nerves and I hated every second I drove this car on the street. Now mechanically, once you, you, you have to be that type of person that can appreciate that and can appreciate the sacrifices and if you're using this as a weekend car, you're gonna love every second of it. It's not something that you wanna spend a ton of time in. And depending where you're at, people really, really look at this. It is just that American masterpiece sports car that ties the past and the present together. Now what FCA and Dodge couldn't particularly do or Dodge couldn't do well was do something like this. Or the modern Hellcats, where they start to figure out that the interior matters a bit more. And the, the TRX here is a great example of how to make a great street car and then when you go out on the track or like the Hellcats when you drive it on track you're comfortable there you're comfortable on the street and the Viper is not that at all so that's the big difference in the passage of time with the Viper but I look forward to driving the new generation doing a video on it big thanks to the owner for bringing it out from Wisconsin for us to molest and have our way with thanks for watching I'll see you next time <music>